Okay, now uh, part three uh, to my uh, mini lecture series. Um, so from part one and part two, you should now know by now how to calculate the, uh, the portfolio return and portfolio risk. Okay, so this is something you should know, okay, how to calculate, right? Now we're talking about um, portfolio theory here. What's portfolio theory? Well, suppose you have a universe of assets. Okay, a universe of assets. Okay, and each has its own expected return and uh, uh, standard deviation. Right. So say, okay, in the universe. Okay, when I say the universe, that is all assets. Okay, all assets in the world. Okay, in the universe. Okay, so not just stocks, not just bonds, uh, but uh, it can be uh, paintings, it can be old coins, it, it can be real estate, it can be anything. So here you have all the combinations of expected returns and standard deviations. Okay, so that, that gives you a little scatter plot like that. Now, from uh, the the from the lecture we had on correlation, okay, you should uh, remember seeing this. I did not go through that in, in my last video because that is not something that was difficult to uh, to understand. So I didn't include that in my in my last video. But uh, as you should remember, the relationship between um, sigma and return, okay, depends on the correlation. If two assets A and B have a correlation of one, it forms a straight line. If it's less than one, uh, it's that getting curves. When the two have a negative one correlation, you, you have two straight lines, right? Two straight lines, okay? So here I go back to uh, my correlation discussion, right? Suppose you pick any two assets, okay, in this. Uh, sort of universe, right? This set, okay? Any two, right? Now they will have their own correlation, right? Okay. So when you combine the two, this is the it, it tells you the all the possible combinations of these two assets, right? So so as these two, so as these two, so basically you get a bunch of curves, right? You get a bunch of curves, right? Okay. Assuming that of course they're Correlation is uh, between one and negative one. If it's one, you get a straight line. Negative one, you get two straight lines. But in 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 this world of finance, you cannot assume perfect correlations either way, negative one or, or positive one, because in order to have perfect correlation over time, okay, it has to be consistent. Now, even if you found a set of data a uh, sample that, that actually gave you perfect one or perfect negative one correlation, there's no guarantee that this same perfect correlation will continue, will persist. So we can never assume that two things will have perfect correlation going, going in the long run. So based on that reason, okay, you only expect correlation to be between one and negative one. And that's why we have curves, right? So because of these curves, right, Okay, you have basically a cloud of curves. Now you can also, you can even uh, choose any point on the curve and combine it with any point on another curve, right? So you have basically a cloud of curves, right? You keep doing this, you run a program to, to, to find these curves, right? So you can have a cloud of curves, right? In the end, what you have will be a cloud of curves. So the outer boundary, okay, will bound all these curves. Now, this is what we call the opportunity set. This thing is the opportunity set, all right? Which bound all curves. In, in other words, that's the outer boundary of all curves. This part down here from the minimum variance to, okay, this one, this one, this point here, the minimum variance all the way down is not efficient because, okay, let's go back to this. Because if you pick any point, okay, you can always find a better return that offers the same risk. So this part is not efficient, right? So this part is known as the efficient frontier. And I apologize for the for the noise that that sort of distorts my 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 speech. But uh, that that that's life. Anyways, so um, here's the efficient frontier, right? And there exists a risk-free rate, a risk-free asset, and we all, always use the T-bill, okay, the rate, the T-bill rate to proxy this uh, risk-free, the rate of the risk-free asset. So what we say is, okay, if you connect this risk-free rate to this point here, let's say, right, we form what we call a capital allocation line. So this line tells you 
Okay, let's call that asset A here at this point. So this line gives you all the different combinations of the risk-free and asset A. All right, is that a good line? Clearly not. Let's pick this point. If you pick this point, clearly there's a better point right above it, right on the efficient frontier, which offers you a the same uh, same risk, okay, but the much better return. So this is not a good line. When I say this is not a good line, that means you have mixed risk-free with the wrong asset. So you keep doing this, let's pick another point, right? You keep doing this, okay? Now this is a better line, okay? But it's still not the best, not optimal. So you're gonna keep doing it until what? Until you hit this point. This is the tangency point on the efficient frontier, right? Okay, and we call that the market portfolio, okay? Now why is it the market portfolio? Why is it called the market portfolio? Now the market portfolio consists of everything in the universe, okay? A tiny fraction of everything in the universe, right? So why is it the market but not market, you know, less a few assets? Why does it have to be the market portfolio? I explained that in my lecture, okay? So uh, if, I don't want to spend, you know, more time on that. So if you, if you are, are not sure why, you can come to me, okay, during my office time and uh, I will explain that to you, okay? I, this, I, the video, I want to keep it short and concise. Okay, so that's the market portfolio. We call that the market, the capital market line, right? The capital market line. In other words, this line here, the capital market line is a line that shows you or that captures all the different combinations of risk-free and market, okay? So any point on the capital market line only has market risk because the market portfolio only has market risk. Now there's two sources of risk, remember, right? We have uh, a systematic risk and firm-specific risk, okay? This here market only has market risk, which is systematic. So in other words, if you are a smart investor, your rational investor, you would only invest along the CML because at each risk point or each standard deviation, the CML offers you the greatest return, right? Okay, so this is the capital market line and all points on the capital market line are, uh, 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 offer, you, offer you the best return at each given standard deviation, okay? Now, moving on, we have the SML, the security market line. Now, since, since all points on the CML are just combinations of market and the risk-free, right? So all we are concerned about is the market risk, right? Because as a rational investor, you should not, you should not hold a portfolio that is uh, subject to uh, a firm-specific risk because that should be diversified away because it can be diversified away, so you should diversify this risk. If not, then you're bearing risk that you should not, and you are not compensated by this risk according to the capital asset pricing model. Because it's easy to, to be diversified. You just, uh, you just need to buy, say, a stock fund, right? And you can eliminate a lot of uh, 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 firm-specific risk. It's very easy to diversify your portfolio, right? These days especially, buy, get an index fund, right? So if you just get a basket of, uh, of say, 15 stocks, right? And they spread all across the different sectors in the economy, you're more or less diversified, right? In fact, if you go beyond 15 stocks in your portfolio, the, the uh, uh, reduction in total risk is not so significant, okay? So the, the, the bottom line here is, since the CML only has combinations of market and risk-free, the only risk that we're concerned about is systematic risk or market risk, okay? Or beta, right? So here we look at Beta, which captures, in my lecture, I talk about what beta is, right? Beta for security I, remember this is the, the expression, right? Covariance of the security I with the market, right? Divided by the market variance, okay? So this is beta of a security, right? So, so now I'm talking about... Uh, P for portfolio, so given a portfolio, it can be an asset, it can be a portfolio. Given the beta of your a portfolio or asset, okay, I want to see what return it should offer. So here, I have another line known as the SML. So here, I, I have the same risk-free, okay, I have the same market, it's the same, same market return, same risk-free rate, but the x-axis is beta, 
Remember why we are concerned about beta risk? It's because looking back to CML, right? The only risk that matters if you're a rational investor is market risk. Because on the CML, okay, along with CML, it's just combinations of risk-free rate and the, the risk-free asset and the market portfolio. And the market portfolio only has market risk. Risk-free has no risk. Uh, I, let me continue. So I was talking about the SML, right? Why we are concerned about systematic risk is because a rational investor should diversify all the, diversify all the uh, uh, syst uh, non-systematic or firm-specific risk. So what, what we are concerned about is systematic risk because it cannot be diversified away. So because of that, we look at this graph here, which uh, is returns against beta, okay? Now, what this says is given the systematic risk of, of your asset or portfolio, what return it should offer, okay? If you just uh, put, put a point here, P on the SML, Okay, and then you form two similar triangles, right? So from your elementary geometry, you should know that uh, two similar, two triangles that share the same hypotenuse should have the same slope, right? So here I have this, right? Equality. Beta M is one. Why? Well, remember what beta is, right? Beta, the definition of beta is the sensitivity of your stocks returns to movements in the market portfolio. So if the market, go, if the market goes up by 1%, if my stock goes up by 2%, then the beta of my stock is 2. All right, so the, by this definition, if the market goes up by 1%, the market goes up by 1%, right? So it's, so it's basically beta of market is 1. It's by definition. So if this is 1, you don't have to worry about this. So then you move this, transpose it to the left, transpose it to the left, what you have is A world famous CAPM, capital asset pricing model, right? Okay, so this is the, the expression that tells you given the beta, the systematic risk of your portfolio or, or asset, what return you should expect according to CAPM, CAPM, capital asset pricing model, all right? So, and why, again, why are we only looking at beta? It's because for a, diver, for a diversified investor, the only risk that matters is systematic risk, okay? You should always diversify your investment as much as possible so as to eliminate all the uh, firm specific, uh, okay, or we, we call the uh, non-systematic or non-diversifiable risk. I'm oh, sorry, a diversifiable, pardon me, diversifiable risk, so let me come again. So you should always, as a, as a rational investor, diversify your uh, uh, diversifiable risk or known as the firm specific risk okay and what is left would be something that you cannot diversify away that is your market risk or known as the systematic or non-diversifiable risk non-diversifiable risk okay all right it's not it's not easy to do this in one take so excuse me if it's, if it's not so smooth okay but i'm trying my best to, to deliver my my mini lecture as smoothly as possible Okay, so here's the cap M. Now, let's, let, let's just go back to the CML for a minute, okay? And uh, that will conclude this uh, part three of my mini lecture. Okay, the CML looks like this, right? Again, okay, the market, the risk-free rate. Now, you can form an expression for this as well. Now, this is the capital market line, right? Just say this is, again, portfolio P, okay? Again, you do the same thing. You do the same thing, but here is sigma, right? So you do the same thing as what I did before, okay? What you do is you transpose this to this side and that to that side. What you have is RP equals to RF plus RM minus RF divided by sigma M times sigma P. Now, this is known as the Sharpe ratio, right? Excess return divided by the standard deviation. That's called the Sharpe ratio, S-H-A-R-P-E. Okay, now uh, this is the expression for the capital market line, okay? So given this total risk, okay, this is total risk measure, what return should I expect, okay? So now what's given this sigma, okay? What return should this P offer, right? Now, as you can see, since P is on the CML, okay? 
it must be a correctly priced security because what lies on the CML must lie on the SML, right? Because on here, on this capital market line, the only risk is systematic risk, right? This is, it only has market risk in P. So, and, beta, and when we look at the, the capital asset pricing model, it is expressed in terms of beta. So if a portfolio lies on CML, it must be correctly priced, okay? So, but it's not, the other way around is it's not necessarily true. So don't think of the portfolio that lies on the SML that is correctly priced must be an efficient portfolio, right? So there's a one way implication. So if, it's, if it lies on the CML, it lies on the security market line, okay? But a lot, if it is correctly priced, it doesn't mean it is an efficient portfolio, right? So you have to be careful about this point. So it's a one way implication, okay? So on CML, means, okay, it's on SML, okay? There's a one-way implication, okay? All right, and that is uh, part three to my video, okay? I, uh, in, in the next part, I will very quickly, in a few minutes, tell, uh, show you why beta I takes the form of covariance of, of security I with the market divided by the market variance.